small scale agriculture. Um, this farm does produce an income. Um, it took us a couple years to get there, but uh, using um, uh, municipal grants and state grants and federal grants, we were able to build a lot of our infrastructure with relatively no cost and minimal um, investment on our part. And uh, for us, the competitive advantage is we live in the city. Uh, the land was relatively cheap, if not free. Uh, we live right here with the farm and we have access to all types of markets uh, to distribute our products and we don't have to drive very far to, to get to them. So um, here's the farm, if you can believe that or not. This was our farm in uh, 2012. And um, I show this picture just to show that we chose this property uh, because we want to do small scale agriculture. And though it doesn't look like a gym, it is now. And uh, uh, it goes back to just the plan. And Jim mentioned plan your work and work your plan. And I want to drill home that you, you really need to have an idea about what you're trying to get done. And we wanted to be a micro farm. And we knew that we only needed a half an acre or less to, to, to create a profit on that farm based on the kind of crops we wanted to grow and the market that we wanted to sell to. So I live in that white house and I'm actually renovating the house next to it. Uh, and uh, here's another picture, that's the back 40, if you will. Uh, you'll see over time, the wash station is off to the left, the high tunnels are in place, and then that lot there across the street is our uh, expansion lot. Um, so there's the, the lot across the street that I purchased. I got the property, all the property, a half acre for about $500, and the house cost me about uh, $5,000. Uh, so I, again, I got in for pretty much no money. Uh, and here's a little video just to drill down the importance, in my opinion, of doing a lot of infrastructure work at one time. So the first year we decided to throw a lot of money in just infrastructure development. So as you can see there, the guy across the street was doing irrigation, I'm soil prepping, we're building the wash station there, and this guy's digging the irrigation lines and the electrical lines. So before we got in a hurry to start growing tomatoes or to start making a marketing plan or whatever, we spent all of our energy and all of our access to capital and, and, and everything to just build the infrastructure. Everybody wanted to grow quick, everybody wants to grow quickly, everybody wants to put in chickens and orchards and all this stuff. We just did infrastructure work, soil management, we built the soil uh, and then, and we used professionals to do this so we didn't have to waste our time because that's not our expertise. So going back to that approach, our approach is we want to invest early, we want to develop the infrastructure, and then tools to fit the farm and farm to fit the market. And we developed a micro farm. Um, and what I mean by that, most people think I do a micro, uh, micro greens. That's not, that's not what I mean by that. But we wanted to, to uh, standardize the, the farm. So the farm is 30 inch beds, and they're all divisible by 25. So all the tools that I have fit a 30 inch bed spacing and then we can, dict we, can, we can determine how many transplants or how much seed or how much water or how much labor is based on a 25 foot bed. So I know exactly how many carrot seeds it takes to seed a 25 foot bed, a 50 foot bed, and a 100 foot bed. And over time, I can now make predictions on how much, um, how much crop should be coming off of the same 25, 50, 100 feet. And then I can start predicting how much money I can make each year. And so uh, that's how we kind of set up uh, the farm. Uh, and then, then going into some of the tools, I want to start with this slide. And what I mean by unsung heroes is these are some of the most crucial tools that we use on the farm. And, I, and I'm serious about this. I'm a public health professional. And so I take public health and personal health very seriously. And so I really highly recommend everybody uses hats and sunscreen and wear sunglasses. Uh, and then over there in the top right hand corner, ear protection all the time. If we're running equipment, I don't care if it's a um, if it's a, a weed eater or a lawnmower or the BCS, I highly recommend uh, wearing ear protection. Now, of course, then the next, next photo, which I think are very crucial, are uh, earbuds of some kind uh, because it can, it can really improve the morale of your labor or yourself and really improve the experience that you get doing meaning, you know, tax, ta uh, ta repetitious tasks like weeding or, or cleaning and things like that. So I highly recommend that. And then, of course, rain gauges and a, a high low temperature gauge. It's really nice to be able to see different microclimates, if you will, or, or, or different areas of your farm, even a small one like ours that gets a lot different rain, uh, you know, or, or the temperature and things like that. So I recommend these really easy tools to get at first. Here's a simple shot of the tool shed setup. Everything's laid out. I like everything to be organized. And going back to the lean farm approach, only getting tools that you need, 
um, making them easy to use, easy to access. I really don't move anything around. Everything is always there. So if I have an apprentice or if I have a laborer, I'm able to just give them direction. They can go right to the tools and they're all there. Uh, again, uh, soil is really important to us. Uh, we, we, we soil test yearly and we're in the urban core, so we do heavy metal tests. We do things like that to make sure that we're not trending in the wrong direction with some of those uh, to make sure we have a healthy soil for uh, healthy crops for healthy people. Uh, the BCS uh, is something I don't really use that often. I got it as a community resource. So we've got the tool with a bunch of attachments that we let local growers that wouldn't have access to this tool utilize. So for example, other growers in the area can borrow this tool to till up vacant lots, to play with these tools before they make that big investment. And sorry if I'm going quick, but I really want to go, go fast. So, so slow me down if you think I'm going too fast, but that's why I'm moving with such urgency here. Um, here's a shot of, again, how we, how we manage our soil. Uh, I import it to start, and that's the advantage of a small scale. So once I sort of uh, uh, started reducing the, the seed bed uh, using tarps, and I'll show that in a second, I just imported lots and lots of compost. I'm talking about 200 cubic yards the first couple of years. I moved it all by hand with, uh, with, with, um, with, with a, a wheelbarrow and a, a rake. And so then instantly I had, you know, six, eight, even 12 inches in places of just brand new great topsoil, if you will. I got it from Bluebird Organic. I like that product better than Missouri Organic. Uh, it's a little more expensive, but it's worth it. And then those pictures to the right are our uh, attempt to use cover cropping. Despite being a small scale, we do try to keep cover cropping in the rotation uh, for soil health, for beneficials, and just to rest areas of the garden to make them more productive. And more soil prep. We don't really use the BCS. I've only used it a couple of times on the property. What I really do is I broad fork up in the right-hand corner. There's two broad forks. One sort of a massive one that we use uh, to start with because of all the debris that's in these urban core lots. You don't want to pry with a smaller Johnny's uh, broad fork. But again, if you look at those broad forks, the Johnny's is 30 inches, well, 27, but about 30 inches. So I can do it just one time and go down the entire bed. Um, as I mentioned, all of our beds are 30 inches uh, wide. Down below that is a bed preparation rake, and that's 30 inches. So you can prep your bed really efficiently without having to put up string lines, you know it's 30 inches, which if you don't wanna use the bed rake, you can use the tilter, which we've seen a couple of times already. I'll show a video in a second. It's a great product if you have great uh, soil. It's not good if you have a lot of um, clay or rocks, it's not gonna do that great of a job, but it does a good job if you have a high organic matter. Uh, it's very easy to use and there's a lot of technology as everybody's kind of seen already, that's coming out with using drills as the power unit on these. Um, there's, there's no oil, it's all electric. It's obviously just the battery from the drill. And that drill can be used for the tilter. It can be used for the greens harvester, which I'll show you. And they're even coming out with like the power harrow and things like that, that goes on the BCS that uses the drill as the power unit. This thing is obviously cheap uh, to have. Um, you don't have to uh, you know, you know, pay for gas and um, it's, it fits our scale and it's good inside of tunnels. So here's a quick little video of it being run. Um, this was just the other day. So again, I broad forked the bed and I had a cover crop on top of it. I broad forked the bed and I just ran this guy over. And again, it's 15 inches. So one pass down and one pass back and I've got a 30 inch bed made ready to go for the cedar. Um, it takes a little bit of finesse, but if you use it over time, you'll get good at it. Uh, we had an apprentice who's on, on this uh, webinar right now, use it for the first time this weekend. And honestly, she probably did a better job than Lisa and I do uh, after just running it one time. So it is, yep, it is very, it is very, very, uh, very user friendly and it's for all uh, body shapes and sizes. And as you can see, you can offset the handle so you can, um, you know, save your back. So moving forward here. Uh, weed management. We have an approach to weed management that we start by using tarps to uh, to kind of create that that stale seed bed and moving from there we use different hoes and on the left there's all the different hoes that we use. Um, if you look on the right it's what you would, what we would use like rogue hose if you're trying to get remove sod. We don't use those anymore because we don't really have any sod. Next to it is the hula hoe and they have different uh, uh, sizes that can go in between your your beds or your crops. Those are great um, and we use them for pathways, but if you can start reducing your seed, your weed pressure, you can use hose like the collinear hoe next to it 
or the wire weeder hoe, which is that one that's on the far left on the picture on the left. And what's great about that, it's made by Never Sink Farm. It's got all those different spacing weeders right there. You can hold that on your, your, uh, your belt hook. And so your carrots have an inch space, your kale has a foot space, and you can just continue to change out that head. So you buy one, one handle and all those different wire weeders, and you can carry around the farm with you. And again, for us, it's in very big farms, so it's not that big a deal. But if you have to walk out, uh, you know, half an acre, an acre, you want to have everything on you. So those are the, the th those are how we manage weeds with the with the um, you know with the hand uh, hand weeders. And then this is a hoo or a, a wheel hoe, which we use just basically for pathways. And I think people are familiar with this product with this with this tool, but it helps on your back a little more than just like the handheld hula hoe. And you can change different things like the sweeps and the, you know, different size of the, of the hula hoe itself. And it's great for walkways and pathways. Um, again, I apologize for going so quickly, but I want to make it through. Uh, and then once we prep the beds and once we uh, or weed the beds, here's how we kind of do, how we plant the beds. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner are the only two tools other than the cedar that we use to plant. I use my hand because the soil's so loose and I use that, that little uh, transplanting knife at times. We use the uh, bed marker to your right there. That picture is a bed marker. And I have a, I have a, I have a video after this, you can see it. It's basically, a, again, an interchangeable uh, handle with a bunch of different attachments that you can get and it lays a grid out on your bed, a foot by foot grid, an 18 inch by 18 inch, whatever you like. And then it's really easy to, uh, to plant your transplants and they're all straight. So then your um, weeding apparatus fits right in there and you don't have to worry. You can, you can aimlessly go through your bed really quickly with those weeding apparatuses because your plant spacing is so precise. So as that's how we transplant. And then we seed with the Jang Cedar. We have a JP1 in the bottom and the top is a JP5. So we use, depending on what crop we're putting in, um, those two cedars. And we've had really great success with those. We could almost have a class on the cedar itself. It's, it's complicated, but uh, once you get the hang of it, it's really neat. Uh, here's a video of the, of the uh, gritter. So again, the bed's prepped and there's the gritter and you're not gonna see a great grid there because we didn't, but you can kind of tell what it does is it puts that grid on the, on the bed. And now you can go in there and it's a foot by foot square. So you can determine if it's a foot apart or two feet apart, foot and a half, and it's really easy to follow that. Okay, um, and then here's another, uh, here's, us, here's the cedar in action. So the beds are prepped in there and that's in the high tunnel. Um, and then Lisa's gonna be using the JP5. And so she goes down one pass, three rows perfectly spaced. She turns around and comes back and we have six beds, six rows planted in that bed in a matter of seconds. Um, and then over to the right there, those are the different cogs that can allow different spacing for your cedar to operate. Um, here's some harvest tools. Um, you know, we use, the, we use the carts, the Vermont cart, everybody's familiar with that. Um, uh, and then I have this backpack sprayer in there just because I didn't know where else to put it. But we use the backpack sprayer for foiler applications and then some organic uh, pest management. And then just some other hand tools that you'll need for harvesting. Once we harvest and post harvest is a big deal to us. We keep everything clean, keep everything tight. We follow all these rules though we're not certified for any of it, but we follow all the rules. Um, so right there is a greens harvester. People are familiar with the greens harvester, I'm sure. But again, you're using a drill to, is the action that actually moves that, that macrame and a, um, a serrated knife and, and puts all your crop behind it and then you can put it in a tote. It works very well, it's 15 inches. So again, 30 inch bed spacing down and back. You can, you can harvest a 50 foot bed in minutes. Um, next to it is a five gallon salad spinner, which we don't use anymore. I just wanted to show people what we, you can start with. We have a 20 gallon one in the next slide. And then over to the right, the hand washing sink, maybe the most crucial tool on the farm especially today. We, we like people to wash their hands before they start. We like people to wash their hands after they're done in the field. We wash hands before we process, after we process. And right now it's really crucial, but it has to be separate from your other parts of your wash station. The scale, just a simple scale. And then one thing about plans, we always like to have extra components to every tool we have. So farmers and friends where that harvester comes from, 
that's a set of all the little tools or all the little pieces you would need to make that harvester work if you get in a bind or if you break a piece. Uh, moving forward here, there's the wash station to the left uh, and then the shed to its le uh, to the further left. So all the harvesting tools and, and things like that are in that shed. Uh, and then the wash station is really tight. Um, it's just all, uh, you know, it's, it's set up perfectly for us. Uh, we have a cool room and a cold room that we built so we could put tomatoes and other crops in and also have root vegetables in. The upper right hand corner there is just a look inside the shed with uh, some of our harvest totes. And then the bottom right is that Hobart spinner that's a 20 gallon that changed our lives a couple of years ago. We do a lot of cut and come again greens. Here's a window unit that we use for the cool bot, um, um, uh, for our cool wash station, I or sorry, for our cooler, I should say. Uh, it's just Home Depot, uh, $600 air conditioning unit. And as you can see to the right, there's the hole that we, we, we put in the wall to put the unit. We were, had this out this weekend, just cleaning it and servicing it. And then the cool bots used to keep the room cold. It's, it's really great. Season extension, we have a few different things. Um, we use, we, on, on the left picture, the large tunnel is um, an NRCS grant tunnel. Uh, Greg Garbos at City Bitty uh, designed that tunnel. It's movable. You can kind of see the skid there if you look in the bottom corner. That helped us escape uh, zoning issues because it's, it's, it can be moved even though it never will be. Uh, the tunnel next to it is a simple $800 tunnel that you can put up in an afternoon from Farmers and Friends. It's a great tool. Um, and then we use the black, the black tarps underneath for weed prevention. Um, and then over to the right, you can see again, those other two small tunnels from Farmers and Friends. They're 14 inches wide, sorry, 14 feet wide by 50, 50 feet long. Again, only like $800, $1,000 dollars are really easy to put up. In the bottom right hand corner is what one of those tunnels looks like when they drop it off at your house. It comes on a pallet. It's very easy to do, it's manageable. Um, and I got a little video of us just, just again, um, inside the tunnel this year, pulling off row cover when it got really cold a few weeks ago. And um, between the, the uh, plastic and some row cover, you can really have crops survive down to 20 degrees. Uh, a couple more pictures there. And I'm gonna be real quick, this is the last couple of slides here. Here's our irrigation. So we talked about drip tape and then we, we hadn't really talked about the wobbler systems, but um, we have both. So we have infrastructure of the wobblers everywhere. Um, so we can use those when we have seeded crops and then we can also use drip tape uh, when we have crops like tomatoes to Dr. Rivard's point, you might not wanna uh, overhead water everything. So in each field, we have both. So we can do either. Um, and here's just a little picture of that field using the wobblers. And what's nice about these is they're responsible for three beds on each side. You can turn the zones off so you can, you know, not have to water every crop at once. Uh, uh, a little expensive to get into, but once you get it, it's reusable every year. It's there for a long time, whereas drip tape you're always replacing. And so there's the farm now. Um, uh, and the house, obviously we were working on it at the same time. A couple of little pictures, that's the back 40 I mentioned earlier. Um, and there's us at market. We sell them a farmer's market and direct sales to restaurants, which is 90% of our revenue. And then there's a, a before and after of the farm, just to show you guys that are starting out that really if you have a plan and you really be patient and put in the work, you can turn um, something that doesn't look like it can be a farm into a productive growing space. So there it is. I hope I was quick enough, but not, uh, um, I hope you got something out of that. Great job, Neil. Um, one question that came up in the chat, and I think I actually asked you this when I was on your farm a few days ago, is how did you terminate the cover crop in the area where you showed the tilter? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that case, uh, that one I did with a, um, uh, a weed whip, just a weed eater, um, because of the type of crop it was. It, it, and it didn't get established that well, let me be clear. What I like to normally do is have it winter killed and then it, once you broad fork it and maybe hula ho it, it's, 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 it's broken down enough for the uh, tilter to work. However, the tilter does get bogged down a little bit with some of that plant debris. It's not a tiller. It's not meant to turn that crop in. It's meant to just do that first two inches of tilt. It, it, it won't get hung up on, those, on the weed or the, the cover crop debris, but I try to remove it. Great. Well, that's awesome presentation, Neil. Um, 
we're going to try, we meant to record the whole thing, but the only thing we ended up recording was Neil's presentation. And, wow. and that's all you want to see anyway. Just kidding. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll try to make that available as soon as possible.